Revelation 21, verses 2 through 5. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with men and women. He will live with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief, crying, or pain. The old things have disappeared. And then the one who sits on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Let us go. Sorry, I'm going to change that out. We keep replacing parts on that mic and thought we had it here. Let us now worship God and remember before him his faithful servant, Jean Elspeth Gifford, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand and join in our call to worship? I'll read the light print, and you'll read the bold. God is our refuge and strength. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. Though its waters roar and foam. Though the mountains tremble with its tumult. Please remain standing and join in our first hymn, number 399 in your blue hymnals. What a friend we have in Jesus. Almighty God, whose love never fails and who can turn the shadow of death into daybreak, help us to receive your word with believing hearts so that hearing the promises in scripture we may have hope and be lifted out of darkness into the light and peace of your presence. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and we continue to pray as he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into evil, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll now have uh, scripture readings from two of Jean's granddaughters. By the way, the pastor forgot to change the scripture in your bulletin, so uh, Psalm 23 and Romans 8 are the readings for now. <clears throat> and this is in King James Version, so Mumu would be very happy about this. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Ye, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading is from our verses from Romans 8, starting in verse 18. The Apostle Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For in hope we were saved. Now, now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own Son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Seven, thanks to God for my Redeemer. <laughs>
a time of sharing and Jean's son and daughter will come forward and granddaughter will come forward and share a few words with us at this time and then pastor Bob Anderson uh, Jean's son-in-law will uh, offer the pastoral prayer today uh, Bob is a covenant or retired covenant pastor um, he actually serves in the covenant in another way at this time uh, but he'll offer the prayer for us after the reflection It was in uh, preparation for this uh, memorial service that Robin, Robin stumbled across my mom's personal testimony. It was uh, presented to this church some 15 years ago. Robin read it to me over the phone, and I immediately knew that it should be read for her service. For, for me, two words capture the essence of my mom's life, faith and family. She had an unshakable faith that sustained her through many trials in her very full, full life. And she had a sacrificial, loving devotion to her family that would influence every part of it. Her example has carried me through my own life's journey. She was and will always be my hero. So I invite you now to look at this beautiful picture of my mom right here. And I will be reading her testimony, her final words to all of us. My mom. When I was first asked to give my lay witness, I thought, how can I really ever express my deep faith in God and how it has carried me through all of my life? But I will try. I was born a covenanter. My maternal grandfather was a covenanter, minister, and my paternal grandparents were two of three 13 founders of our covenant church in Cranston, Rhode Island. Again, my mom. My mom and dad met at this church, at the, at the church in Cranston, um, and wh while my grandfather was serving as a pastor. This is the church that I grew up in. She goes on, I started, to, I started Sunday school at a very young age, was active in youth groups, attended Bible camp, which was then held in Cromwell, Connecticut, was confirmed, and went old enough sang in the choir with my sister, my mother, and my father. Church was a big part of our family life. I had a wonderful foundation for my Christian life, and as I grew, my faith grew also. My mom continues. It was at a third district Sunday school rally that I met a young fellow from the Attleboro Church. <laughs> Bob Hogberg and I dated for several years, fell in love and married. We had two children, Robin and John. We were very happy, but little did we realize that we would face years of serious illness and difficulties within our immediate family. We came very close to losing our son twice, once as an infant and again as a young boy. My husband was hospitalized several times for manic depression. And so to ease the pain, he turned to alcohol and eventually became an alcoholic. Then came the tragic death of my sister-in-law who left two young children. It seems there was one crisis after another. I can remember a 12-year-old son asking one evening at the dinner table, do you think God is testing our faith? Illness struck our parents as well as my husband. With many hospitalizations and within a year of each other, we lost my sister-in-law, my father-in-law, my mother, and my husband passed away. My mother continues. I was 42 years old, a widow with two teenagers and a home to support. These were truly difficult times for our family. As in the past, I leaned on God for help and guidance. I am so thankful for the Christian foundation I was given growing up, for it was through deep faith as well as prayer that it got me through those difficult days. God's unfailing love was, me, was with me every step of the way, and I know no matter how difficult the circumstance, I can always turn to him. I have so much to be thankful for. I will always be thankful for my church family, for the many prayers and your love and caring support shown to our family. I especially am thankful for my two children, Robin and John, for the Christian lives and the Christian nurturing they received here in this church, which was so important to them. God has been good. And then through sorrow comes joy. After being alone for about seven years, I met and married a wonderful man that you all know, knew as Fred. We have, a truly, uh, have truly been blessed. 
And I think God had his hand in our getting together as we met right here in this church. You know, God does work in mysterious ways. She ends her testimony with uh, two pa uh, Bible passages. The first is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And then Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And her last words were, praise God. So may my mom's testimony and final words to all of us who are present today be an inspira inspiration to live our lives grounded in faith and nurtured in the love of family. Thank you. Amen. I'm going to put my glasses on. <clears throat> I just want to say thank you first to all of you for being here today to celebrate and honor mom's life. I know she left an imprint on many hearts. And I am thankful and rejoicing in the promise knowing that she, many who went before her she is re reunited with right now through Jesus Christ. And that is something to celebrate. When I think of my mom, I think of so many words like beautiful, selfless, independent, faithful, fun, courageous, long-suffering, gracious, honest, artistic, musical, opinionated, even if you didn't want to hear it. She had a contagious smile. She was committed, a protector, a provider, and she loved with her whole heart. And that's the short list. Jean Elsbeth Swanson spent her childhood growing up on a dairy farm in Cranston, Rhode Island with her older sister, Beverly. Although her protective dad didn't actually have them doing daily farm chores, not his daughters, my mom loved hanging out with him and riding the tractor for hours, holding onto his shoulders as he bailed hay for the cows and the horses. She spent as much time as possible with her daddy or with her grandparents whose house was on the farm. She told me once there was nothing like the smell of fresh cut hay or the smell of the barn to bring back a flood of wonderful childhood memories. She loved the farm. Jean, and many called her Jeannie, lived in a home full of love with a coffee pot always on and something in the oven. My grandma was a great cook. I just lost my place. Um, her mom was a great cook. She had household chores that often kept her busy, but also many interests which held her attention, like sewing, knitting, reading, listening to the radio, biking all over the place, swimming piano lessons, baking, painting, and shopping downtown Providence with her mom. She seemed to always be in motion with friends, and family or friends were constantly coming and going, sharing meals, and selling special, celebrating special occasions. And I'm sure there was a lot of homemade ice cream on that dairy farm. Now I understand why my mom never sat still when I was growing up, because she always had something to do. I recently found her five-year diary, which she kept from age 11 to 15. It was hysterical to read. Her handwriting was atrocious, but it was truly a treasure for me to get a glimpse of how she spent her time and what things were important to her during those formative years. My grandfather worked very hard and long hours as the family provider, and it would have been easy to make no time for anything, but the church remained the core of mom's family life. Her parents were involved members at Calvary Covenant Church in Cranston, where she was baptized, confirmed, and attended church and Sunday school, youth group, sang in the choir, sang solos, and she sang duets with her sister. And then she attended summer camp at Cromwell, Connecticut, year after year. I'm grateful for my grandparents who modeled a strong work ethic and instilled core, core values that provided and nurtured a strong foundation of faith and family on which my mom could firmly stand and depend on then in the, and in the years that followed. My mom loved the church. She was an active member here at this location and formerly over on South Main Street for 60 plus years. She taught Sunday school, vacation Bible school, sang in the choir, sang duets with my dad. With, she was active in Women's Sunshine Circle, Ladies' Aid, Bible studies, attended women's retreats, and participated and shared the fall fair. She was a faithful servant, and she served with joy. I remember when she was in charge of the Vacation Bible School crafts in the church basement over on South Main Street. It was full of sticky-fingered, loud kids with glue everywhere, but she had the patience of Job with her eyes fixed on a beautiful project completed for each child. I remember the endless summer hours she and Muriel Stromberg spent in her basement toll painting beautiful objects, making pine cone wreaths, or whatever other creative ideas they came up with for the fall fair that year. 
They had so much fun together, and I watched in awe, hopeful to be that creative someday. I remember all the Pilgrim Pines women retreats she went to with her friends. She was quick to pack, and I know they were in a hurry to come home, <laughs> stopping along the way to shop or to find fabric bargains at the woolen outlet. A lot of the women sewed, and they were always thinking of their next project. Mom loved all the hymns and sang duets with my dad. I can remember them practicing around the piano. Even in her dementia, in these past few years, she would sing loud and in tune when her care facility would have a church service. The staff would always be amazed. Those hymns were rooted in the foundation of her faith. The church to mom was not just about the activity she was involved in. It was what motivated her to live a grateful and joyful life in spite of her circumstances, and for years had nurtured her faith to be strong and unshakable for when the trials came, and they came. In 1973, when my, <clears throat> when my dad passed away, after a history of manic depression and alcoholism, our family was devastated. My mom was 42 and left with two teenagers to raise in an uncertainty of what the future would hold. She felt her life had ended too. I found a note she had written to the church for the church time capsule, which included this. I will never forget years ago when our family faced much heartache and sadness. There were many days I did not know which way to turn. My strength was drawn from not only my faith in God, but from the love, concern, and prayers from my church family. What would I have done without you? She later, ends the prayer, <coughs> she later ends with a prayer of encouragement to the church to grow and to be a source of spiritual guidance and help to many others in the years ahead. Thanks again, she said. I love you, Jean. And then she closed with, don't hide your light from Matthew 5. My mom persevered through many difficult years, living with my dad's bouts of depression and drinking, and then the years following his sudden death, and not without heartache, but she held on to her church family and her deep faith in the one who she trusted and depended on. She modeled that faith for John and I and intentionally instilled the same core values she was taught. She didn't complain about her circumstances, and she didn't stop living her life and being grateful. She made sacrifices for us in those lean years, providing what we needed, because she knew how to squeeze a nickel. <laughs> and she made sure we had a college education. And in the midst of all that, she also suffered from debilitating migraines, which she had for many years, and chronic back pain. But that didn't stop her. She always pushed through, doing her best to do the things she enjoyed, and remaining faithful to what God asked of her. A friend from her Bible study group wrote in her 80th birthday card, I love being in Bible study with Eugene because you always come with a smile, no matter what God is asking you to endure. My mom taught me that in all she endured, that God is bigger than our circumstances. He's faithful and trustworthy, and he makes a way when there doesn't seem to be one. Her faith was unshakable and her love sacrificial. For that, I am forever grateful. Years after my dad died, mom met Fred in an adult fellowship program sponsored here in this church. God was good, and he blessed them beyond measure as they married in 1980 and had 39 years together, both actively involved here for years. The church family was and continued to be a rock in my mom's life after she faced the consequences of a stroke and progressive dementia. She still never complained, and she was known by her smile and her kindness to all who cared for her. I was told over and over by the staff in both Mansfield and at Life Care how much she was loved by them. I think her life drew people to her light drew people to her and God was still using her. My mom loved her family. In October 1946, just before her 16th birthday, mom met my dad, Bob Hogberg, at a church district youth gathering. After a six-year courtship, they married in 1952, and within years they were raising a family. <clears throat> Growing up, we too had a busy household. Our life revolved around church activities, Sunday school, church, morning and sometimes evenings youth group, church picnics, and then there were the school activities and music and scouts, household chores, baseball, sewing lessons, sleepover parties in the basement, family gatherings, planned and spontaneous. Kind of sounds familiar. Mom kept us busy but provided a home full of love and gave us opportunities to thrive as well as to build a foundation of faith through the church like she had been given. Again, she always made sacrifices. She went without so that John and I could have what we needed. We didn't have a lot, but we never felt we were lacking anything that was important. Mom was frugal and a saver. She cut out coupons, she bargain shopped, and she could anything that she could buy with gold bond or green stamps, she would. 
That was a lot of stamp licking over the years, and I got to help with that. I wonder if it was her frugal saving that made her so attached to her pocketbook in her dementia. If you try to take that pocketbook away from her, it was like she was holding the bank, and all it had in it was a few crumbs left from her cookies and some tissue and maybe a spoon or something from one of her last meals. But man, she held on to that pocketbook. Mom was the hub of our family, present and involved in our activities for church, scouts, school, etc., driving us wherever and engaging with our friends when, we were around, when they were around. <clears throat> I remember my first seventh grade girl boy party in our basement. Of course she would come down and check on things. It was recently when I read in her diary that I saw a list of junior high boyfriends in the back of the book. Each one crossed off as the next one came along. Just like that, they were gone. And next to their names were sometimes written hubba hubba. <laughs> it's no wonder she was checking on me. Anyways, she never embarrassed me and my friends always loved her. Mom made beautiful wedding cakes for extra income. She would decorate them for hours. I remember delivering them in layers in the back of the station wagon, and it was my job to make sure they didn't crash into each other, which is a little bit of pressure. But I was, always enjoyed coming to the church where she would assemble all the layers and be in awe of what she had created. On a minimal budget, she made a beautiful home for our family with her artistic eye and decorating skills. She continued with her art and gold leafing and toll painting for our home. It seemed like she could take anything and make it beautiful and special. She was a meticulous seamstress, keeping with the trends for both herself and me. And she always had a great sense of style. She was also a really great cook and hostess. Holidays, birthdays, and dinner parties were special with amazing food, always enjoyed by family and friends. But I remember those times around the supper table with simple meals, saying grace, and talking about our day as my, being my stronghold. Camping trips, family gatherings on the Cape at my grandparents' cottage, and Sunday afternoon rides with my parents singing, You Are My Sunshine, are special memories for my heart. And then there were the ice cream stops, of course. Through marriage, Fred's daughters, Deb and Cindy, joined our family, and as each of us married, our spouses were lovingly welcomed. And then when the grandchildren came along, Mom was overwhelmed with joy. She adored all nine of them. The family circle had grown larger, giving her opportunity to paint special things for their rooms, participate in birthday parties, babysit, plan one-on-one -on -one shopping trips, picnics, family meals, festive holidays, and plane trips when needed for long visits. She dressed up as a clown, face painted. She had silly overnights with the girls. She made birthday cakes, and she loved buying gifts. Moo Moo, as she was called, followed the lives of each one as they grew and said many times how proud she was of her grandkids and how she prayed for them every day. She felt very blessed. And by the time she passed away, she had 11 great-grandchildren added to her flock. And last but not least, Mom loved her friends. Her friends were a priceless treasure to her, some enjoyed for over 70 years. And that was a gift, and she knew it. She surrounded herself with friends her whole life. And there were those special ones, strengthened through shared joys and sorrows, praying for each other and showing up whenever there was a need. Her friends provided a wealth of laughter and shenanigans with many women's retreats, shopping trips, basket weaving classes, couples weekends, getaways and dinner parties, and those coffee clutches around the kitchen tables where life was shared. She modeled for me what true friendship is and the precious gift it is over time. Mom golf sailed and walked the mall for exercise with friends. And until mom couldn't do it anymore, she played skippo with her pals. And they were a competitive group, I know. I tried to fill in once. She made, she made lunch dates and she attended Bible study. Later, she loved going to those social activities at her care facility, participating in games and crafts, and of course, always enjoying her ice cream. My mom dearly loved and appreciated her friends, and I know they loved her. In closing, mom knew the priceless value of growing an unshakable faith throughout her life and joyfully living it out with family and friends. She loved with her whole heart, unconditionally and sacrificially. Her legacy is forever imprinted on John's and my heart. May it continue to live through us and our children and our grandchildren. Thank you, mom, for being your example, and peace to your memory. We love you.
Hi, thank you for being here today. My name is Kirsten and I'm Jean's oldest grandchild. Jean was many things to many people, but who was Mumu? Mumu was beautiful inside and out. Her smile lit up a room and she made you feel loved every time she looked at you. She knew how to make you feel special and each one of us grandchildren always knew how much she loved us. There was never a question. She showed up for sports, birthdays, often making the cake and special events. She showered us with hugs, kisses and told us how much she loved us all the time. She was a fashionista. She had an amazing sense of style, loving beautiful clothes and accessories, especially jewelry and pocketbooks. She spent hours with us kids playing dress up and beauty parlor, uh, always kind and patient, letting us try all of her lipsticks, makeup and nail painting our nails. We went for shopping trips uh, at Emerald Square Mall. Those were wonderful memories, complete with getting lunch and ice cream, of course. She loved sweets which benefited us grandkids a lot. She made sure to have our favorite things on hand and took the time to bake cakes for birthdays, make cookies and other sweets when we were together. Trips to Bliss Brothers was the best. She was an artist of many talents, whether she was creating beautiful works of art with a paintbrush, decorating amazing cakes, sewing, or making baskets with friends, she knew how to make time to do the things that she loved. She was strong and she was honest. She knew exactly who she was, and she taught us to be strong and to be ourselves. You always knew where you stood with her. Things didn't go unsaid, because she'd let you know exactly how she felt. <laughs> she was honest, even if you didn't want to hear it, but she was kind. She was hilarious. She loved to have fun. She had the best sense of humor, even until the end. She didn't have to try to be funny, she just was. She always knew how to make us laugh. She was a woman of many phrases. Some of our favorites are, oh dear. Hey, how are ya? I love you so. Give me a kiss. Oh, for heavens. Well, I never. <laughs> and our personal favorite, yoo-hoo. She was a blessing to all who knew her, but she was our moo moo and we will miss her every day and continue to give thanks for her life and the ways she influenced all of us. Thank you, Kirsten. Does anyone, would anyone else like to stand and say a few words? I'll hand this microphone to you once, if you do. Bob? So Jean made our wedding cake here in this place 47 years ago. It was over 90 degrees the days before air conditioning. And uh, as the reception took place down the hallway there, I remember eating and going through the festivities and keeping my eye on that cake as it began to slowly, <laughs> slowly lose its edge. <laughs> and I was like, we need to... We need to get to this cake. <laughs> Anyways, many, many, many good memories for many years. Would you pray with me? We do give you thanks, our Father, for Jean's life. We, each one of us has many things that, that we remember and we recall about her, things that did make us laugh, things that made us smile, things that touched our hearts in special ways, things that drew us to her. We thank you for those. Thank you for the things that, that we heard shared this morning, her own testimony, the things that, that Robin and Kirsten uh, remember so fondly. We give you thanks, God, that uh, above all, she was a person of faith, and that even as her memory clouded in recent years, uh, that faith was undiminished. We thank you that um, your humor was intact, that she still made people laugh, make people cry, 
We're thankful that she was able to touch the lives of, of the staff that uh, were in charge of her care, who were able to see past an, an, an elderly woman whose memory was not what it had been to see uh, a genuine and a real person that had, had lived a rich and full life and still had much to offer. We're thankful, God, that we got to know Jean, but most of all that in her life, she knew who you were. We thank you that she is at rest, that she is at peace, that she is reunited with those who have gone before. And we are reminded of, of a great legacy that she has left, that we have benefited from. So we thank you, God, for all these things and in all the ways that Jean touched our lives. Peace to her memory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong? Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart from His command? What will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and never we Christ, our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood. Who holds our faith when fears arise? Who stands above the stormy trial? Who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ? Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess, Christ our hope in life and death. grave, what will we sing? Christ, He lives, Christ, He lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with Him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feel in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope and
Thank you, Matt. As we are sitting and soaking that in, I was reflecting back on an Easter a couple years ago. It was the first Easter um, after COVID started. And one of the hardest things for me as a pastor about COVID was just feeling like my visitation to people in hospitals and nursing homes got derailed. And it was always a big part of who I was as a pastor, and it was hard not seeing Gene. Um, but Bob and Robin and I have this little joke, because every time they'd come and visit Gene, they would never tell me they were coming until after they got here, but they would always catch me visiting Gene. And they, I, I just told them, I said, I'm just lucky. I just, it just happened to be that those were the times I picked. But it was... I think it was God's hand in that, because um, it kind of told them that I was paying attention. <laughs> but it also uh, helped them to understand that part of the reason I was paying attention is I knew ministry had brought them to California, and that th that distance made it hard on their family. And so it had a special layer of meaning to go and visit Jean whenever I did. But it was also meaningful because I could hear the stories and get to know a generation of people in this church who were simply amazing. I mean, these people, both the women, the women especially were especially close with each other, but the couples um, that spent time together uh, had this layer of fellowship and fun that was just a joy to get a glimpse of and to know about. And it was through my visits with people like Gene that helped me to see and understand. I'll never forget visiting Fred in the hospital after he had knee replacement surgery. And Gene, I think, had had her stroke already. And so he felt this sense of urgency to get back to her and help take care of her. And I've never seen somebody recover from a knee replacement surgery so quick. I mean, it was remarkable how fast. He like, bam, he was back, and he, he went to it. Gene was fun and creative and generous and loving and faithful and honest and, as we've heard, blunt. There was something about that generation when they got older. They lost their filter entirely. <laughs> And it, Eva Anderson was like at the top of the pack. She just had no filter. She'd pat me on the belly and be like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> but as we heard, Jean grew up in Rhode Island and Massachusetts and spent most of her adult life as a part of this church. She sang in choirs from the age of 16 on and sang solos and duets with her sister and also with her husband, Bob. And as we heard, Bob died at a young age, and Robin was just finishing high school at the time, and John was in the midst of high school. Um, church was the center of their family life. She was a single parent at a time where this wasn't nearly as common as it is today. John said, as we heard earlier too, that these were lean years, and she made sure uh, that he and Robin had all that they needed. She loved unconditionally and sacrificially. And as John said, he considered her his hero. He once told her this, and she corrected him and said, heroin. <laughs> but she also said, but why? And he said her sacrificial love poured out of her so effortlessly that she could not see how her efforts kept the family together when so much of their lives were falling apart. John also faced health issues and challenges when he was younger and remembered how well he was taken care of by her. Robin said uh, she had the debilitating headaches and mi migraines and back pain and worked right through it, and she was not a complainer. She worked as a dental hygienist in several dental offices in Rhode Island and Massachusetts during her vocational years, and there she was the provider and protector. After she got married to Fred and became a grandparent, life was a little less intense. Fred and Jean were a fun couple, and as Nellie, one of her grandchildren, described her, she was 
a fun grandma. She created time and spent time with the grandkids whenever she could, and she loved taking them shopping and playing games and baking with them. Robin said she was an awesome cook and, and was always busy, never having idle hands. She was always doing something. She cherished her family and her friends. For a while, Bob was serving a church in Rhode Island, and their children had the great opportunity to spend a lot of time with them in that period of their lives. Robin said that her mom once said, I have a very simple faith. And when she said that to me, I said, yeah, but it wasn't simplistic. And I think the difference is, is that life had enough complication for Jean that a simple faith allowed her to face the challenges that she faced and to share in life in the way that she did. As I said, Jean was a part of a, co- a generation of covenant women from our church who were quite simply amazing. The support they offered to each other has always been a source of inspiration to me. When I first came to this church 15 years ago, I was trying to figure out the layout of the small groups in our church. There were a few small groups that met. There were some people who desired more. And so I was trying to figure it all out before we presented some new opportunities. And then I heard about this group that met at Dunkin' Donuts. And I'm like, wait, what's that? And they said, well, it's not really a Bible study or anything. It's just like a group that meets. And I go, okay, so where? And then they told me it was at the mall. I'm like, the mall? There's like a 1,000 Dunkin' Donuts within a 30-mile radius right here. So I was like, why do they go to the mall? Anyway, I was blessed to go and visit with them at the mall on a couple of occasions. And I remember it being, including people like Eva Anderson and Ray and Muriel Larson and Carl Johnson and Muriel Stromberg and Paul and Gunny Sparman and a woman named Louise, <laughs> Elmer and Brita Johnson, and this is just to name a few. Did I miss anyone? Did you ever go to the mall? You don't remember. <laughs> so anyway, I was like, uh, but Dick and Ruth Cedarberg were very close to them as well, and um, I know uh, since she's been in the nursing home, Betty and Ruth would often go and visit. Uh, but there were um, this amazing group of people, and it was great visiting with them, and, and I, I learned that the reason they met at the malls, they used to be a walking group. So they would go there for exercise and they would walk around the mall and then they would stop at Dunkin' Donuts and have coffee at the end. But at the stage of life I met them all, their exercise was getting from their car into the <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts. And so they, they just met for coffee, except that Eva and Louise and Jean would also go shopping afterwards. They would make sure to include that. One of our grandkids, Kirsten, said, Grandma once said, you need more color. That's color for those of you not from New England. <laughs> color. You need more color on your lips. So you had to put lipstick on. <laughs> uh, I, since I'm, or, uh, blah, 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 blah. I, I should say, too, some of my visits with Jean and Fred at the end were the most fun because they ended up at Epic in Norton. And Fred was up in the assisted living and Jean was in the nursing home, but we'd get together and play bingo together. It was hilarious. And, um, but Fred also did a, uh, one of those tests to see what his heritage was, and he found out he was Irish, not just English. And so he started singing Irish jigs <laughs> to all the ladies. And he would entertain the whole crowd. It was so funny. He was a trumpet player while he was here, but he started singing Irish jigs. And, and if Jean didn't know your name, she would shout out the famous, yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo. Um, the other thing I need to mention is her love of ice cream and going to Bliss after church on Sunday mornings. We still have people who go to Bliss after church on Sunday mornings, um, but there was quite a crowd that used to go and enjoy that place and time together. She loved her routines and her work 
and in her week. So these traditions like playing cards on Thursdays, church on Sunday, bliss after worship, and the mall for Dunkin' Donuts were all a part of her routines. She sang in her choir, was active in our fall fair, and um, with choir rehearsals on Wednesday nights. Um, Fred shook things up for her, though, and this was where she learned how to sail. She loved sailing and all the adventures they went on. John said Fred made a sailor out of her, and she loved it. They also loved to travel and would travel all around the world and always brought things back for the kids and the grandkids. Yoo-hoo, she would say, <laughs> with her bag full of things that she would buy while she was there. Nellie said she was a super strong woman, and she pointed out that Moo was an inspiration to the other super strong women in their family. In Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you